good morning. Good morning. Hope you've had a great week already, have you? Well, good. I have a question for you. Can you be honest with yourself? That's a hard thing for people. You know, we look in the mirror and we see what we see, and uh, studies have shown that men especially look in the mirror and we still see Atlas. You know, still see strong, don't you? We still see vision of what we used to be. Um, women, do you smile when you put your makeup on? I've always wondered why my wife smiles when she puts her makeup on. She says, I guess somebody's smiling back at her, right? I don't know. Can you look in the mirror of your life and see what you really are? Who you really are? Um, that's a hard one. It's hard. Um, this past week, Joe Mazzula, who you may not know, is the coach of the Boston Celtics basketball team. They won another world championship, or at least United States, whatever you call it, NBA championship. Um, he happens to be African-American. And a reporter asked him in an interview, said, how do you look at the fact that this is the first time in NBA history that two African-American coaches are facing each other? The other one was Jason Kidd from the Dallas Mavericks. And Joe just looked at him and said, how many of those coaches were, black, were uh, Christians? How many coaches were Christians? And the reporter didn't say anything back. Because the reporter wanted to look at the world in black and white. In this party, that party, this belief, that belief, controversy, argument, whatever. Joe Mazzula simply said, he looks at the world through the eyes of Christ as a Christian. Not as this color, that color, this person, but as a follower of Christ. In fact, he said he wasn't going to Disney afterwards. He was wanting to go to Israel. How do we see ourselves? Are you somebody that gets caught up in the busyness of life, the, the, the hurry and bustle, the, the job, the money, the worry, the fa all the stuff, the new cars, the house, the whatever? Or are you somebody who simply says, I'm a Christian, I endeavor to serve the Lord in my life? Now you say, well... You know, a lot of us, I get, I get a lot of Christians are like this. Oh, that hurts my hip, doesn't it? You, you know, golly. I want to have a foot in both. I mean, I want to chase my money and my house and my car and this and that. And the, I believe in this and I believe in that. And I'm for this and I'm against that. And, you know, but, but then, yeah, I'm a Christian too on Sunday. And, uh, you know, but the question is, are you living a life where your lens of everything you look at is Christ? Or are you caught up at times? And, and maybe some of us are, you know, maybe some of us are like this. Maybe, maybe sometimes we're, but self-reflection asks you to look at that and go, you know, I'm going to be somebody of grace. I'm going to be somebody of encouragement. I'm going to be somebody that loves other people is forgiving but I'm also a Christian who's a disciple who wants to at the end of the day meet Jesus in heaven can you be honest with yourself of where you stand the book of 1st Thessalonians we've been talking about of course I wasn't here last week. My most wonderful, she was up here a while ago, Ashley Reynolds, um, our wonderful children's and youth director.
director did a great job filling in. I told her, I said, I got to find a preacher that's terrible so that when I come back, they actually care and go, oh gosh, Clay, we're glad you're here. Anyway, um, but yeah, it, uh, it wasn't here, but we're going to pick up in chapter five of First Thessalonians, and then we're going to read chapter one of Second Thessalonians. They connect, and I'll tell you why when we get there. So he begins, if you have your Bible with you, we're going to put it up on the screen. It says, begins, it says, now brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not know. We do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, the day of the Lord, he's talking about, they thought that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. That he ascended into heaven and he was going to return in their lifetime. But the day of the Lord, has, as we have come to understand it, is the day of the Lord is our reckoning. Our moment where we meet Jesus. And it's ironic, it says, as labor pains in a, on a pregnant woman, they will not escape. Um, we all have a day, and we don't know when that day is. And uh, this past week, as I said, I, I talked to, I spoke to uh, a little more than a week ago, the McKeevers, Paul and Mamie, your grandson, and his wife, and they were so excited. Linda and Tyler were so excited about having a baby the next day. We prayed for Olivia Grace, and we prayed for her health and all. And she had no idea that the next day, that during childbirth, she would pass, that she would die. Our day is not counted. You, you plan tomorrow, but it's not, it's not a given. Um, life is so fragile. We have a young man, Jared Theisman, his parents, within 10 days, of each other passed this past week. And da dad passed away and his mom passed away, both in within 10 days of each other. Both had had some issues, but nothing severe, but then suddenly, boom. And the day of the Lord is the day you will meet Christ. I don't know when that is. I don't know. I, I looked at a picture. Yesterday was my sister's 50th wedding anniversary. I was seven years old and standing there as a, as a uh, what do you call it, ring bearer. And, and I said how, how amazing that is. My mother and father were standing there, and, and within a little more than a year, he would die, and within two plus years, she would die. Meet Jesus, the day of the Lord. And so when Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, and he's writing that, you know, they were going under persecution. This church had he had started he was worried they were going that they had stopped but he heard good things about them and how they had endeavored in the midst of persecution and he says that he says but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief you are all children of the light and children of the day we do not belong to the night nor the dark nor to the darkness so then let us not be like others who are asleep but let us be awake and sober for those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Those are words he'll later write again in Ephesians 6. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live or may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you were doing. The persecution that was going on in that church, people, you know, in, in ancient days, met their, their lifespan wasn't that long. Their health care wasn't that great. Death was a reality on a regular basis. A lot of times people had lots of children because they knew some of them wasn't going to survive. 
We don't have that anymore. But we still have death. We still have death. And he says, I, I love this one. He says, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Remember I talked about wrath a couple of weeks ago, what wrath was? Wrath is not the anger of God. Wrath is actually the sorrow of God. Because here's the thing. He says, you, he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live together with him. In other words, the cross, the salvation of the cross is the forgiveness of yours, mine, everybody's sin. So that we can look at the Lord and say, thank you. And we can embrace the Lord as our Savior. Because remember, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And when we say... Who, who, who is going to suffer God's wrath? Those who won't accept God as their Savior. Because they're living over in this side of things and they're pushing and shoving and got to get and got to and selfish and worried about life and what they got and what they will get and what they don't have and versus through the lens of faith of what God has already done for you and to you. He's saved you and you have been adopted as his child. You're children of the light, he says. You know, it seems to recall, this is one of those moments I love putting pieces of the puzzle together. Some of you go on vacation, you put big pieces of puzzles together. I know some of you do that. I've seen it. Right, Megan? <laughs> Piece of, and when you put the pieces of the puzzle together, you ever heard maybe Psalm 23 talk about Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How do you get a shadow? You can't have shadow in total darkness, can you? You have to have a light. The shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, when we die, when you're children of the light, you're moving towards the light. See how Scripture works together? This is The, the plan is... This is dress rehearsal. The plan is that you and I and everyone, we will meet Christ. We will move towards through the valley of the shadow of death to the light. And when you're a believer, there's, there's no worry. There's no fear. Fear not, Jesus says again and again and again and again. And so there's no fear. There is just a sense of <sighs> wonderful. You're a child of God. He continues and he says, uh, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And I love this. Is, he's talking about the church. Don't be disruptive. Don't cause Because you know what happens in church sometimes? Again, we get, you know, I've said many times, the church would be great except for all those people. <laughs> I mean, Sometimes we, these people, we, go, we get selfish. We, we say we're Christians and we push ourselves over and go, I don't like that hymn. I don't like that message. I didn't get what I wanted. Or is that just, that's not, that's not true here, but I've seen that in other churches. Have you ever seen it here before? Some, I love that. This is beautiful. If you could see, some shake their head no and some shake their head Yes. According to what committee you were on, huh? <laughs> yeah, true. That's true. But but that's the that's the issue. You know, church is to be selfless, not selfish. And that's what he that's what Paul's saying. You guys have made yourselves known by your love, and that's what I preached to you. The first three chapters, first four chapters of of First Thessalonians were about. Remember, because of you, because of you, because of you. People have done amazing things. You, you've seen, and I gave some examples of, of people who have gone from, you know, really tough situations because of their, their faith changed and they, they came to Christ. They were welcomed here. They were taught here. They grew up here, whatever. I, I'll give an example in this very building. 
You had people, somebody planned this building. Somebody years ago planted the building next door. Somebody before that planted a building crossing the cemetery. It's not, no longer there now. Right? That's the history of the church. People that have gone before you. People are now planting this church and creating, continuing to have a place to worship. And these young folks are enjoying it. As well as the babies being born. The, that's, this is going to be their church where they grow up. And that's what we want. We want to welcome folks who, who hadn't realized it yet. That don't even know they're loved. We're, we're welcoming them in the door. And we're going to teach them. And that's what the Thessalonians were doing. They were known for their faith and their relationship in Christ. And he continues, he says, uh, he says, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, he said, or I should say, verse 20, yes, make sure, he basically says, make sure that uh, nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you to faithful, who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so they, they were worried that the day of the Lord had already missed them. Because once this was read to them, they thought somehow that the day of the Lord had missed them. That they just, we, we weren't special enough. Satan was whispering in their ear. So Paul wrote a second letter to them. And this second letter begins with, ver with chapter 1, verse 1. says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches... We boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Isn't that great? So you live your life, again, with the lens of what's best for God, what God is having you do. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to study. I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. I'm going to evangelize. I'm going to do these things, and I'm going to do those things. And sometimes these things get in the way, but they're just, you know, the job and the, the, the having to have a car. and the, that, those, those are things, but I focus on these things. I, yeah, I've got to deal with those, but that's, that's, I gotta, I, here's where I live. Here's what I look at. Here's how I gauge my life. And how I treat people. And how I love people. And he says that, basically right there, he says, uh, all this is evidence that God is, that God's judgment is right will result, will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. And then verse 6 says, God is just. Now, see, that's, some people don't want to hear that. They just want to hear 1 John. God is love. And they emphasize God is love. You know, Jesus with the tie-dye t-shirt and the peace, love, and everything, and you just do as you please and live like you want, and it's all about you, 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 you. You're, just, you're all welcome to heaven. You've been to a funeral lately. Everybody's in. Right? And that, that's God is love. But that's not what this says. Wait a minute. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Huh. That's not Jesus I was told about on TV. 
some of the preachers I've listened to. I know a couple of years ago I did a whole series in Luke about this, the condemnations of how if you don't live as a faithful Christian and don't, re if you just, if you're trying to straddle and live more over here and oh, once in a while I go to church on Sunday over here, but then I got to live in the world and do all this stuff. If, if I have, that's, God is just. Full of, Jesus was full of truth and grace, but truth is, there's a, there's a way to live. There's an there's a acceptance clause. When you say, Lord, I love you, I, I accept your love and your forgiveness, and I can't wait to live in heaven with you forever, there is something that goes, it's called discipleship. You ever heard that word? <laughs> this is the see the, the modern Christians in this world somehow think that Christianity is just a easy peasy, nice and easy, and just never have to worry. I just go, yeah, I believe. I drop a dollar in the plate, I'm good. Or I just sit home and watch TV, and it's all good. And when I die, they'll have a funeral and they'll talk about me going to heaven. Good luck with that. What's he say? This, this, what is? Paul say next he says uh, God is just he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus they will be, what? Punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. In other words, there's going to be happy and there's going to be sad. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. And joyful, joyful, we adore thee. All at the same time. This includes you because you believed in our testimony. The good news is you're a believer and you're practicing your faith. You're going to heaven. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I tell you what. We just celebrated earlier. A year ago, Daryl Lambert drowned. Heart attack. Saving his nine-year-old grandson. And we celebrate. He was a member of our praise band next door at Amplified and uh, we just celebrated him a while ago and they played every song they played he, he had a part in writing or, or working with in some manner Brad you were over there it was wonderful wasn't it couldn't ask for better but I tell you what he'd tell you right now if he could be here he'd tell you love what's important love Jesus as your Lord and Savior and love your church seriously that, that's, that's what's important. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. And, he, and this is what he's saying. He said, you are believers. and you will, He says, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness, not every desire of stuff, of goodness, for goodness in your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, in you and him, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. A life of faith. Everything you see through the eyes and lens. And it doesn't mean you're going to get it right all the time. Who does? Nobody. But the effort and the, and the brokenness of saying, Lord, I need a Savior. Guide me. I seek you in prayer. I'm, I seek you in reading Scripture. I seek you. I want, what, I want to see the world in this manner. I want to stop this craziness and this foolishness over on this other side of chasing that which doesn't matter. That's why books like Ecclesiastes were written. <sighs> Let's 
I want you to celebrate when death comes knocking. When the day of the Lord appears in your life, I want to gather and celebrate. I know, Kim, we celebrated your dad. You know, we celebrated a life of faith. And yes, there's tragedy. And yes, it's unexpected at times. But you know what? We celebrate the fact that somebody's a believer and they've gone home to Christ. I, I, I think about a silly story I, I read. Um, former, he, he was the, uh, the chief judge of the South Carolina Court of Appeals. His name was Alexander Sanders, Jr. And uh, he told a story at his daughter's graduation from high school about her when she was a little girl named Zoe. And Zoe was three years old, and uh, the judge, uh, he was a lawyer back then, said he came home and came home to discover his wife and his daughter, and his daughter's just boo-hooing, crying, crying, crying. Her turtle had died. Three years old. I thought, how young to be attached to an animal by that point. But, yeah, she was crying. And uh, Mom had said, you know, it's going to be all right. It's a, uh, when Dad got home, Dad said, we, we'll go buy you another one. But she was smart enough to know that that one was dead. And she knew that wasn't the same, and she was still crying. In fact, she cried more, and the judge was like, what do I do? And he thought to himself, he said, i tell you what, how about we have a funeral for the turtle? Now, the mind of a three-year-old, what's a funeral? She said, what's a funeral? And Daddy said, well, hmm. It's where we, it's like a birthday, we celebrate. We have cake and ice cream, and we celebrate. And she said, I like that. And she stopped crying. Get the cake, get the ice cream. Hey, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Let's go. Exciting. She finally stopped crying. Praise God. I don't know much about turtles. But that one started moving again. It wasn't dead after all. And little Zoe looked up at her daddy and said, Can we make it die again? I love that. So you can celebrate another party. Folks, that's what I want out of life and death. Personally, for you, I want every one of you to live a life where people celebrate that you just went to heaven, that you passed through the valley of the shadow of death, and that you came out the other side, and that when you got there, it was a homecoming. And you were embraced and you loved and you were happy. Because I'm telling you, Paul tells us, Jesus tells us, so a lot of writers in this book tell us that being with God is the greatest thing ever. Ever. Not chasing stuff here. Being with God. So I pray that you will have the courage to look in the mirror and figure out where you stand when it comes to your walk of faith and your discipleship. Amen.